Hey everyone, Dr. Frunky here with a very special final diagnosis on the Frank Fisher and Robert Carter Talon. Uh, many of you know uh, that this knife came into my possession at the cost of a bunch of other knives in my collection. My collection is not particularly big. Right now I think it's actually only about five knives uh, and that's recently expanded. Right before I had this I only had about three knives. Uh, that's because this knife uh, is in a world of its own. Now I've had a whole lot of fun making these videos. Uh, my habit with knives and my sort of addiction has really progressed along with it because I enjoy sharing these with you guys. It's, it's opened me up to a lot of different opportunities and things uh, where I'm able to pick up knives that I never thought would be possible and that's what this one is. You know I have been lusting after a Frank Fisher knife ever since I saw Jim Skelton's video on his battle. Now uh, Jim Skelton is a great member of the community. Everyone knows him. My background is more or less exactly like uh, Mr. Skelton's. I didn't really do that on purpose. I do like the carbon fiber design and this was an easy thing to kind of make and uh, just have as my background. So I don't mean to copy people but this uh, in any case since I watched his uh, video about the battle I knew that Frank Fisher and the Fisher brothers made a really really special uh, knives and I have always been looking at their battles and everything and a little over a year ago I saw some pictures of this knife. This is the Talon which I mentioned earlier this was a collaborative effort or as they called it a brolaboration between Frank Fisher and Robert Carter. Now these are two relatively young knife makers. Uh, they may be my age or younger and uh, they really really uh, have been doing some amazing work and they are commanding very powerful prices for the work that they're doing and it's for a good reason. I need to explain to you why this knife costs what it does and the pedigree that went into making this knife and why it is indeed so special. Well, so Frank Fisher is the son of Todd Fisher. Todd Fisher is an excellent knife maker. Uh, he is well known. He, he's one of the very best uh, custom folding knife makers. He's got some amazing, amazing knives and he's been in the business for a long time and he's good friends with Stan Wilson. Stan Wilson, of course, uh, famous for so many different things, namely the, the non-flipper flipper and some other just spectacular additions uh, to the knife community. You can talk about it a little bit down below, but Frank Fisher trained with Todd Fisher, his dad, and Stan Wilson, some of the legends among others that are down there in his area. And uh, he's such a young guy, but he has so much talent. And even, uh, you know, Todd Jr., TJ, is getting into the mix here. He's the one who makes these really, really exceptionally beautiful pivots. So oh, it's not going to focus for me. Wait for it. There it is. I'm going to focus on that pivot for a second. Uh, Todd is making those pivots now. And it's just really awesome to see how he's developed uh, Frank and Todd together. And that, then they teamed up with uh, Robert Carter. Robert Carter uh, is actually the son of Mel Pardue. Uh, if you'll recall, the <laughs> designer of the Griptilian. So uh, also uh, from a knife making lineage that is, you know, really respectable. And so these two guys with their history came together to make this knife, uh, the Talon. And so this has accents and features from both makers. Uh, when I first had the knife, I don't think I really had an appreciation for the knife, the makers as much as I should have. But uh, in looking at their lineup and what they make, you can see where the history and where the DNA is crossed to make this knife. Uh, if you look at the handle, it's got the shape of Robert's Warfighter handle. Uh, the overall blade uh, shape and profile is similar to that Warf Warfighter. It's a Warncliffe uh, knife, that is, but this one takes it to the next level with the Frank Fisher-esque sort of the battle-like grind there with the double recurve that's so evil looking and so cool. Um, definitely, definitely uh, can see where both makers contributed their knowledge, their design, and their skills. Now, they decided between the two of them they were only going to ever produce nine knives. Uh, yes, only nine. Actually, I'll show you on the inside here. You can actually see that these guys have actually teamed up on this knife together. Let's see if it will focus. Uh, yeah, so there you got Fisher Bros. 
if I can catch the light just right, it says RJC right there, Robert Carter. You can also catch a glimpse of the coloration going on on the backspacer, the spacer for the backspacer, I should say. So um, definitely a lot of history going into the making of this knife, a lot of knife history going into this. Um, and so let's go ahead and break this knife down anatomically so we can have an idea of what we're looking at here. So we've got a 3.25 inch blade of S90V. So S90V is an excellent, excellent steel. Now it's very, very hard and a lot of people complain that it's difficult to get it uh, to a high sheen or a high satin. Spyderco, when they made their Nirvana, had to make their uh, S90V blade that acid wash because it kind of masked some of the uh, imperfections that they had in the grinds. But look at the perfect satin finish. Let me see if I can catch the sunlight just right. Just a perfect satin finish done in S90V. That's really got to be respected here. Now this is a Frank Fisher specific grind. You can tell by the fact that the hollow grind is carried all the way up to that point on the blade. Robert Carter's uh, grind is a little rides a little bit lower, but also a hollow grind. Uh, so I, I don't know if I was getting into it, but the guys are making th nine knives, so they're going to make three of them together. Frank is going to make three, and Rob is going to make three. This is one of Frank's knives, and you can tell by that grind. So speaking of grinds, let me show you the tip of this knife. Let's see if I can get this to focus at all. This is going to be really tough, but okay, all right, let's see if I can do that. Okay, right there. Look at the facets on the top of that swedge right there. The way that he's ground that swedge. Satin finished, beautifully satin finished, but there are faces. There's one, there's two, and there's three faces on the edge, on the rounded part of that blade. Those same faces are sort of seen here. You've got a, a nice swedge up top, comes together like that. Satin f flats, machine satin finish there on the grind absolutely incredible incredible work it comes to an absolutely remarkably sharp tip and believe me when i say that this knife was ground incredibly sharp uh, i just uh, i did not honestly i didn't expect it to come that sharp i was like how can a grind like that actually be super sharp this thing is maybe the sharpest knife in my collection uh, it's incredible. Uh, I keep using that word because it really is. That blade blows me away, and it was the whole reason that I was interested in this knife to begin with. That blade is super dramatic. Uh, it's very unique, and a lot of people were like, oh, you're going to hate that double recurve, and to be honest, I thought I was too. But it's actually not that bad as an EDC knife. It doesn't vary that much from a standard Warncliffe blade. It's got that functional tip. You can still do the drag. But it, that recurve actually allows you to have a nice tip. It's great for opening boxes. It's great for cutting tape. It's great for sneaking under an envelope and opening it. And sort of the lighter EDC tasks that one might have and do with a knife like this. Now, this is not an outdoors knife. This is not a camping knife. You're not going to be whittling. You're not going to be batoning and doing that silly stuff. This is a gentleman's knife. This is pr pretty much pocket jewelry. And so you're not going to be using it in that way. So uh, the blade, I just, I just want to keep appreciating how incredibly nice it is. It is hollow ground to a very, very, very thin, thin uh, amount of steel behind the edge there. And it just slices beautifully. It's got a nice little thumb ramp. No jimping. Again, gentleman style. No, no aggressive jimping on this knife because they know that that's not really what it's all about. So next, we're going to move back and talk about the pivot. The pivot is very special. And that's for a number of reasons. Because, number one, the pivot is, like I said, designed and uh, made by really both of the brothers. Uh, so the original design was, it was a Fisher design. You know, I couldn't tell you if Todd designed it or if Frank did. I'm pretty sure Frank did. But now TJ is making them, and he's making them perfectly. If you can look at the pivot, I want to bring it in as close as my camera will allow it to focus. Right there, okay? I want you to take a look at that pivot. So intricately designed. So, in the center, you've got a small piece of Mokutai. 
you can see it's two different types of titanium that are hammered into one billet, into one block, and then it's turned into that small piece of decoration. So the whole pivot is not Mokutai. I believe that's just a small inlay from the, pi from the pictures I've seen. The remainder of it is titanium, but that's a very small inlay, and it's beautifully done. There's no seam. It's present on the back side as well. Very thinly spaced lines there. Beautiful. Then, uh, the actual ring around it, I believe, is bronzed. And then there are very, very small little uh, divots that have all been almost like a red anodized. It's almost purple, almost red. And then you have the sort of sunburst milling. And then on the outside, it's been anodized a greenish blue. So there are all these different layers of color bursting out of this pivot that's really difficult to appreciate. I try to take pictures of it and put it on Instagram. Some of the pictures sort of do it justice. I don't have a good enough camera to really do that. I'm hoping that this video does it justice and shows you just how beautiful it is. It's almost like fine watchmaking, that pivot. It's, it's just so intricately detailed and, and beautiful. And uh, they'd really do it on a lot of their knives now. They've really perfected that. Uh, I will say the one major and obvious drawback uh, to that pivot system is that I can't service this knife. I have no idea how to open this knife with that pivot. Uh, I'm sure that they've got a tool that they've designed that works beautifully, uh, that doesn't put any damage onto that pivot. Uh, I can only imagine what the bit looks like. I don't even know. But I would never try to modify that pivot. And uh, I don't really like that. To be honest, I do enjoy servicing my knives. I like to take things apart. I like to take things apart just to have fun with it. Uh, and just to see what it's made out of and just to appreciate it even on that level. You know, I love to break down these knives and see what they look like on the inside just so I can appreciate the quality that it went into it. So not being able to open it kind of takes that aspect away, but I understand. This is a knife where you're paying enough money that if there's a problem with it, you're going to be able to just ship it back to the maker and they're going to help you out and just take care of it. Now, luckily, both guys were very generous. Uh, you know, especially Rob was just very, you know, forthcoming and said he would help me service it if a problem ever came up. Uh, and that was really, really nice of him. Loving, loving the pivot. It rides on ball bearings. It's really, really smooth. It was uh, came ni nice and tight. I actually picked this up from Frank himself. He offered it on his Instagram, and I just messaged him right away, and uh, I purchased it from him uh, just for way too much money. But it is very, very, very smooth. It will uh, shake closed. It's a relatively small blade that's been heavily milled, but it will shake closed very gently. Um, now, let's talk about the flipper tab. This is an important point of discussion for this knife. I want you to take a look at it. It's got some finger stuff stuck in there, but take a look at what it looks like, okay? So, this is a flipper that when I got the knife, I was extremely confused. And that was because when I tried to open the knife, all it did was hurt the hell out of me. There's some fairly aggressive jimping on this flipper tab. And even right at the apex of the flipper, there is one jimp just hanging out right there. Just saying, hey, I'm about to ruin your day. Because my inclination, you know, from all the other flippers I've ever had, there are two means of opening a flipper knife. Okay, here's my uh, 0392 BRN GLD. You can either push button it. I'm going to hit my tripod if I do that too closely. Or you can light switch it where you push it back. So pushing, push the button, or flick the switch. Okay, two methods. Almost all flippers have that. Here's the uh, Riot Knives uh, Bodega. Push button, or... Oh, see, I told you I was going to hit it. I did it. Light switch. Okay, good. So, on this knife, my inclination is always to push button. It's a little bit of a snappier and uh, more powerful action. It's a little bit louder. And so uh, I try to do that. And so in, in push buttoning, you've got to push right here. Now, this knife does not want to be push buttoned. And so all I did was jam my finger about as hard as I could 
into that jimping and uh, for the first few days uh, my finger was actually completely trashed it uh, I developed a blister it like peeled it was so awful it hurt really bad uh, if you watch if you go back to my uh, unboxing video of this knife and actually of uh, my good buddy Nico's Resenti Satori uh, this guy right here I don't know if you'll notice but like my flipping in those videos is very weak that's because my finger had been destroyed completely and it hurts so bad but I finally realized that this knife is meant to be light switched so you put your finger on top you light switch it and it's a beautiful action when you do that the detent is incredibly strong that's why that really hurt my finger now after breaking in for a few weeks you can do sort of a modified push button where you can push it sort of down towards maybe this point right here is the vector you know it's not really a true light switching but you can do it that way if you get your finger way up on it and pull it back like that, it will do it nicely. But you're not going to be able to force this this uh, flipper tab into the pivot. Now, sometimes uh, on some flippers, when you push in that vector, it's going to just make the handle fly out. But all you're going to do is destroy your finger here. So that's just something that I learned about this knife while owning it. Uh, and it sort of annoyed me at first, but then it made me kind of love it because it's sort of like only I really know how to flip this knife well. If I give this to somebody else, they're going to have trouble. And it makes sort of a personal attachment to the knife. Uh, and so I kind of liked that. Now what I'm showing off here, and I'm going to try to do better really close to the camera, is the finish work. We're going to move back and talk about the handles now. Look at the finish on this. I'm going to show this as beautifully as I can with as much sunlight as I can. I want you to see if you appreciate the sort of sparkles that are coming across this. This is blackened 6AL4V titanium. Blackening titanium is uh, a very special finish, to me anyways, because it's not anodizing and it's not really coating the knife. Uh, from my understanding, which is very poor of the old overall situation, you get titanium red red hot and then you quench it in oil. And uh, depending on the type of oil you use, you'll get a different type of finish on your your metal here. Now, when Robert does his, all of them are blackened, but the, each one has a slightly different variation in the finish. When Robert does his black, it's like a pitch black. It's like very, very true black, almost looks like a DLC. When Frank does his, it's a sort of inconsistent, almost apocalyptic, almost, I, I call it, it looks like galactic finish because there are like hidden clouds in it. There are these little webs. Uh, it's not straight black. And then I'm gonna get it even closer. It's got this unbelievable copper undertone that's just incredible to behold. Now I'm gonna move the knife back and forth. These are not just specks, they're just sparkles and they just shine depending on how the light is hitting the knife. And it's on both sides and it's absolutely incredible. And then he went and he satin finished all of the flat parts on the top and all around the edges. So the steel and the titanium are finished similarly and they look about the same there. He's got a very, very nice backspacer going on. It's technically a floating backspacer, but he's added these very subtly uh, anodized spacers in there that are also filed and milled. So, so much detail uh, going into this knife. I absolutely love all these little points that I keep seeing. And then of course, the pocket clip is a 3D milled piece of zirconium. This is something that I was a little bit worried about. Zirconium, uh, at least in my understanding, is a little bit stiffer than some of these other steels and maybe prone to uh, breaking or chipping a little bit more. So making a pocket clip out of it is a risky move, but they have left a little bit of space between the clip and the frame so that it's not overly tight. And let me tell you, this has just the right amount of grip and it works perfectly in all situations. This knife was meant to be carried and used with that clip. That's all I'm saying. That's not an overly designed clip. It's not overly stiff. It's extremely usable, but it's also extremely interesting. And just look 
Oh, well, the, the blade is going to mess that up for me here. Look at the finish that they've achieved on that zirconium. It's a matte finish, but it's like almost orange peeled. Doesn't show any fingerprints. Sometimes Zerk is known to show that when it's all shiny. Again, and then against his blackened finish, it's absolutely sexy as hell. I love that. It's really, really nice. So, um, oh, let, let's not forget here uh, the speed holes. So you can see that blade hiding inside of there. That sort of adds to that whole galactic theme. Almost look like planets. And then... To add to that, the detail work here, take a look at each and every hole milled in this knife, including the screw holes. They're chamfered and polished, and they sparkle and they shine. Even the pivot, even the detent ball hole. No, not the detent ball hole, excuse me, that's the... Uh, what goes in there? The stop pin. I'm sorry, the stop pin hole. All of it is chamfered and milled like that and polished. It's beautiful. They've also done a creative job with the uh, lock bar cutout right there. Very unique. Some other knives have that, but it's very unique. I like that. Different. Not the same. Not boring. Now, uh, the inside is not milled out and it is not uh, jeweled but there is still the uh, blackened finish on the inside so very very cool overall this knife is really designed to be a carry knife they wanted their owners to carry these knives and use them and uh, I, I certainly did that uh, I used it lightly because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to hold on to this because it's so expensive uh, and I really have had to sort of fight with that and think about it really hard. And I'm really hoping that I'm able to keep it. But uh, we'll get to that in sort of the final diagnosis part. So how does this knife carry? Well, it's a relatively small size. I can bring out some other blades for a comparison here. Uh, how about this? We've got a uh, McGinnis Knives Rowdy High Tech. I've got my standby uh, 0392 BRN GLD. This is a three and a half inch knife. So this is a fairly small knife, uh, which is not really a problem for me. It, uh, it did help. It wasn't overly small. I'll pull out my other custom knife that I have right now, the Peter Rizzenti Satori. Coming in around three and a half, three point six 3.6 inches in blade length right there. Uh, I'll pull out the Borka Blades. Microtech Knives Stitch, Auto Stitch. This is a much bigger overall knife. They look pretty badass together though, not going to lie. How about a, uh, a Riot Steelcraft Series Bodega? So it's a very small knife. When I showed pictures of it initially, I think a lot of people thought it was going to be a really big knife, but it's really not. It's a very small knife. And uh, I learned to love that because uh, it doesn't really fill the hand, but it has perfect ergos to the point that my index finger hits here, these two fingers are here, and my pinky wraps around the end of it. And so it fills my hand, but it's a small knife. I like that. It's thick. You know, I haven't measured it exactly, but I think it's over a half an inch thick. It's, re it's a, a little bit more thick than you might think for such a small knife. This knife is exactly half an inch thick. And it's about the same, maybe a little bit thicker. The, the contoured handles, something else to appreciate here, these, these handles are all contoured. This is not flat titanium. It's very comfortable in the hand, all day, every day. No aggressive jimping that's hurting you. Once you learn how to use the flipper and you're not tearing your index finger up, then it's very comfortable to carry every single day. There are no uh, major hot spots. I will say that the end of this knife right here, the end of the handle is a bit sharp. When you're jamming it into your hand to flip it, it does take uh, maybe a little while to sort of get used to, but you learn where to place it so you don't kind of stab yourself. That is a little bit sharp back there, but I don't mind that. And that's because if you look at the design of this knife, take a look at the blade and the handle shape. Look where that cutout in the blade, that sort of tip in the blade is going to sit in the handle. 
and then the tip of the blade. It's just gorgeous, the design. So that point is resting there, and that point is resting there along with the handle. So the design that went into this is just levels beyond anything I've ever experienced. The attention to detail is astounding. The quality is just there. It's super, super strong. And uh, why don't we just bring out the scale and see how heavy this thing is. It's really not all that heavy. Set that right there. Four ounces on the nose. Super, super, super light for how much titanium and steel you're really getting in this. It's very, very stout for its size, but lightweight. I like it a lot. Again, the clip works magically. You can take it in and out of any pocket. I wear it on the waistline sometimes, no problem. Easy to do. The speed holes make it secure to uh, move around in your hand without dropping. And it just looks good all day, every day. People are going to love looking at this knife and playing with it. Now, it is a little bit, uh, a little bit murdery, if we're going to use that word. Some people say that's kind of a scary knife. Uh, and I get that. It kind of, I don't know, it looks like a scythe or something like that. But uh, most people, when they look at it for a little bit longer, are going to see some of these interesting things and want to look at it. So, got to love that very much. Now, we're going to get right down to it here. What is my final diagnosis on the Talon? My final diagnosis is this knife is amazing. Truly incredible. Is This goes beyond anything I've ever seen in a knife or in most other products for that matter. The attention to detail, the engineering, the design, and the quality are beyond anything I've ever experienced. Frank Fisher and Robert Carter deserve their status in the knife community. And I understand why their knives command the prices that they do. Now, this was relatively affordable compared to a standard Frank Fisher knife. A battle might run you five, six thousand dollars plus. Uh, the Stan Wilson and Todd Fisher collaboration from Blade I saw on sale for eleven thousand dollars. So to get this in the ballpark of three grand was okay. Uh, a relative bargain. So I had to jump on that opportunity. Now, when I say that this knife is perfect, it really is, but it may not be the perfect knife for me right now. Just like Nick Shabazz explained in his video about uh, hedonic adaptation, we all keep trying better and better and better things until we get to the very top, you know? So we'll have a Wii knife, you know, for $100 or $200. We'll get a ZT then for $400. Something like that. We'll get another mid-tech or something for $500, $600. You know, maybe then we'll go on and we'll get a full custom. We'll spend $1,400, $1,200, $1,500. You know, and then there's the, the crazy, crazy knives that are way up there. Way up there, like these guys. That are just in a world unto themselves. And well... That may not be an area where I should be dabbling right now. I really don't think that I can afford to do that. I'm lucky that I was able to pay for this. I've been able to sort of buy and sell knives and maintain a pretty consistent balance. And with work and everything, you know, I was able to afford it. But I don't think it's somewhere where I should be all the time. And so this one is going to have to move on to keep the channel alive. This is a truly special knife. I'm thrilled to have been able to show this to you all and experience this myself I understand why Frank Fisher and uh, Robert Carter's work is so respected and lusted after. You guys have got to try to experience it. Go check them out on Instagram. Check me out on Instagram at Dr. Frunky. Click like and subscribe for some more videos, guys. This is so much fun. Take care, everyone.